So I should start by saying never in my wildest dreams when I started working with LC North America did I imagine I would be standing here starting a talk with the title Attack of the Killer Tomatoes. Um, and I think I was, oops, yes, I, was, I shouldn't have touched this, should I? Oops. Stay, okay. <laughs> so I, so I, I think in part I'm here to wake you all up and actually sort of set a, a light and jovial but hopefully important tone for the rest of this morning at least. Um, before I do get in, um, we're all obviously asked to give our disclaimer or disclosure statement. So this is my statement. You already know I'm vice chair of ILSI North America. Um, I'm author of a book, which I'll get to in a little bit. Um, I'm paid by Arizona State University that has a definite vested interest in um, socially relevant science and technology, and I have no connection with Killer Tomatoes, really important to mention. Okay, so when I started sort of thinking about um, the, this talk, my first talk was, I, I was asked to talk about science fiction movies and trying to make it relevant to food science and nutrition science. And so I, I started with this question, do science fiction movies have any value to the business of developing new food technologies that are economically profitable and socially beneficial? And of course, there are a few movies out there. You have the deeply scientific Attack of the Killer Tomatoes going back to 1978. Anybody seen this as a matter of interest? There are one or two people in the audience that have seen it. Um, a, a very, very accurate depiction of what can go wrong when you use genetic engineering to make tomatoes that decide that they don't like people. Um, and then, of course, you've got movies like The Little Shop of Horrors um, playing on this theme of flora that decides that actually nutrition is about eating people rather than people eating it. Um, but then if you want to get a little bit more esoteric and get into dietary supplements, you have that classic June. Um, so anybody that's totally lost now, June is all about that dietary supplement spice with which the universe ran on. And then if you want to get really deep and dark, of course, there is the 1973 movie Soylent Green. And if anybody is completely bemused about why I've got Soylent Green up here, talk to me later. <laughs> Um, okay, so the, the bottom line is actually there's very little out there when it comes to science fiction and really understanding the nature of food, science, and technology. But things get interesting when you flip that question around a little bit. So instead, if we ask this question, how can science fiction movies inform the business of developing new food technologies that are economically profitable and socially beneficial, things actually get quite interesting. And not just interesting with food technologies, but technology in general. Um, and I say that because we're living at a time at the moment where our rate of technological capabilities is accelerating faster than it's done at almost any point in human history. Not necessarily the rate with which we can actually create gizmos that do things, but the rate of development of knowledge that allows us to mold our environment and our lives in very, very different and very, very powerful ways. Um, and a lot of this is reflected in how people think about the future through science fiction movies. And so this gets to really the crux of the talk, which is a book that I came out with um, last year, which tried to explore this relationship between people and society and science and technology through the lens of science fiction movies, primarily to try and understand where are the opportunities, where are the pitfalls, and how we can start conversations that are going to be important to the beneficial development of these technologies. So usually when I give this talk, I have about an hour and a half with a, a public audience, and we go through a series of uh, clips, and we talk about technology and science through these clips. I don't have enough time to do that, and I thought that you probably weren't in the mood just to sit back and watch sci-fi movie clips. So instead, I wanted to dive into the rationale behind the book and talk about the journey that led to me actually writing about technologies through the lens of science fiction movies. Um, and I want to start, before I actually start on that journey, I want to give you the punchline here because I know some of you are going to be going through this and thinking, wow, this is boring. So I at least want to make sure that you have this takeaway here. And the takeaway is that if we're going to navigate this tortuous path between good ideas and beneficial outcomes, which is where most of us are with emerging technologies in today's increasingly complex and interconnected world, we need a different map. 
And by different map, I mean we need a different way of thinking about how to navigate through the powerful things we can do with technology so we get to what we actually want to do as a society with it. So that's the punchline, but now I'm going to wind the clock back to 1992. And as I was putting this together, I realized I think this is probably the first time I've ever actually used my PhD dissertation in a presentation. Um, but I thought it was interesting. Um, because this is the beginning of uh, a story of at least part of my professional life around dealing with nanoparticles and nanotechnology. So back in 1992, I was at the University of Cambridge, um, and I was playing around with what were then cutting-edge electron microscopes, studying what we were then calling ultrafine particles. Um, and so I was doing things like applying these um, electron microscopes to collecting environmental nanoparticles and imaging them, but not only imaging, but actually carrying out electron energy loss spectroscopy on them, one of the first studies where we're actually using this technique to look at ambient nanoscale particles. Um, I thought this was really interesting at the time, this is 1992, I was told nobody but nobody is interested in nanoparticles. Fast forward eight years and suddenly a lot of people were interested in nanoparticles. Um, but it started off looking at ambient environmental nanoparticles. So this is going forward to the year 2000, where I was part of the organizing committee for a Royal Society meeting that dived deep into what we know about these ambient ultrafine particles, especially in terms of how they're potentially impacting our health. And one of the aspects of this that came out was we're not only having to deal with things that, say, come out of tailpipes that are important, but we're actually beginning to intentionally make these small particles through an emerging field called nanotechnology. Um, and as things happened, I then very rapidly began to get involved with this emerging field of nanotechnology, and it coincided with a move from the UK to the US. So from the late 1990s into the early 2000s and beyond, the US government started investing very, very heavily in nanotechnology. Um, and they started investing heavily because they saw this not only as a cutting edge of technology, but something that was going to be an economic revitalizer in the US, and a lot of other countries followed suit here. But there was a problem, a very big problem. And here, I, there's a trigger warning here with the next slide. Some of you are going to be distressed with this next slide. One of the problems was in the US, we saw what had happened in Europe with genetically modified foods. And the last thing we wanted was this sort of thing happening with nanotechnology. We were very aware that it didn't matter how good we thought the technology was, if you had concerned citizens spinning a tale of it being the worst thing ever, we were up against a really difficult barrier. And so we realized we had to take the safety issues, the risks associated with this technology very seriously if we were going to convince people that this really was an economic driver and a jobs creator. Things got even worse um, when Michael Crichton's book Prey came out. Um, and when, so, so this is going back to the early 2000s, um, in the, the US government um, and in industries working on nanotechnology, when this came out, this is a book about really bad things that can go wrong with one form of nanotechnology. And people looked at this and thought, this is just going to kill us. And then we heard that Fox Pictures had bought the movie rights to this, and we thought, this is really not good. So people got very, very serious about trying to work out what could possibly go wrong with the technology so we could assure members of the public in particular that we'd got this handled. Um, and I was deeply involved in looking at the science aspects of this for a number of years. In 2006, we came out with this paper in Nature where we began to map out some of the biggest science-based challenges around human exposure, in particular to environmental nanoparticles, so we could make sure we didn't make any serious mistakes and we got the benefits right while minimizing the risks. Um, and as we went through this process, it was very clear that we had a lot of problems, and they weren't all technical or science-based problems. And we began to realize that if we were to really realize the benefits of nanotechnology, um, a lot of people, researchers and developers, but also funders and policymakers, members of the public, needed to get smart or much smarter about risks and benefits. We needed to understand that landscape between where we were and where we wanted to go in a very different way indeed. This wasn't just about the science. And it became very clear relatively fast that what we had was effectively a nanotechnology elephant. 
So I put that up. I, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the story of a group of blind people that have no idea what an elephant is, that are introduced to an elephant, and they all have to describe what they're actually experiencing. And each person, as they have a, a different part of the elephant, gives a story that sounds very different to everybody else. And it transpired that this is actually what was happening with nanotechnology. So for instance, if you're a politician, you felt the nanotechnology elephant and you thought economic growth and jobs creation. If you're a science popularizer, you got fixated on nanobots for some obscure reason. In business, most companies that were investing in this saw this as a marketing opportunity, a way to show that they were at the cutting edge of science and technology. Um, researchers, on the other hand, um, we're really quite opportunistic here. And one of the best definitions I've heard of nanotechnology from researchers is a 14-letter fast track to funding. There was a time when if you tacked nanotechnology onto almost anything you were doing, you were almost guaranteed funding. On the other hand, if you talk to material scientists, even though they were putting in these grants, they would say, yeah, this is just business as normal. We've just changed the name of what we're actually doing. On the other hand, if you're a toxicologist and you've been struggling for years for funding, this was like manna from heaven. Um, fame of fortune, in fact, there are a number of toxicologists that made their name by claiming that nanoparticles were dangerous and we had to do something about it. NGOs saw this as leverage. They weren't particularly interested in nanotechnology, but they were interested in how they could use this new technology to leverage their particular concerns. And if you're a regulator, it was just plain confusing. Um, so we had a really complex and difficult landscape to move through, and it's still occurs to this day. So I, mean, I was involved in this from the late 1990s onwards, grappling with these issues. And so I was really quite intrigued and saddened to see just a few weeks ago, some of you may have seen this, this article in The Guardian about the use of titanium dioxide in food products, um, with this um, not only talking about the use of what they call nanoscale additives, and anybody that works with TiO2 would know that actually you don't want nano TiO2 particles in food products because they don't work as you would like them to. But they actually had quotes from toxicologists, like this one, I wash all my food like crazy. Um, and that was from a US scientist. So still, we have these misunderstandings about the safety and the risks of the technology because people are still trying to wrap their heads around it and trying to craft stories that suit themselves but don't necessarily adhere to the science. So that's nanotechnology. The trouble is nanotechnology is just one of many, many different technology trends. So for the last 10 years or so, most of my work has been involved in the much broader sphere of emerging and converging technology trends. And what you've seen with nanotechnology, with the confusion with how to make sense of it and interpret it, goes for all of these different technologies. In fact, nanotechnology is now a relatively small technology, if you'll forgive the pun, in the vast scheme of emerging technologies. And each of these, if we're actually going to navigate through as a society and see the benefits, we've got to work out how to understand what the real risks are, what the perceptual risks are, and how to navigate through this increasingly complex landscape. And it actually quite worries me that if we can't do it with one technology, how are we going to do it with all of these? So that's a, a big picture view of emerging technologies. You can actually get even more granular here. So it was mentioned that I've worked for many years with the World Economic Forum. Um, each year since 2012, we've come out with an annual list of what we consider to be the top 10 emerging trends in technology innovation. And these are typically trends that we believe are at a point that they're beginning to make an impact in society. So this is last year's list. And so now you can begin to see how down in the weeds we're getting, how specific we're getting with these. And yet with each of these, there are really complex questions around risks and benefits that we're grappling with. Um, and I can show you, that was last year's list. We're just about to come out with this year's list. Um, it's going to be released um, next week in China, and I'm told that it'll probably appear in Scientific American at the end of this week. But just to give you a heads up on what we have here, this is what we're looking at this year. Um, and I want to put this up because there are at least two of these that are directly relevant to food and agriculture. You look at emerging technologies around food security and traceability and control release fertilizers, you can begin to see how these trends in science and technology are beginning to impact fairly significantly within the food sector. And it raises the question, how are we going to navigate from what we know we can do to doing it in a way which is socially beneficial as well as economically beneficial as well? 
This is a major problem. And I want to tell that story just to emphasize how difficult it is when you've got multiple players in the room trying to navigate forward with these emerging and converging technologies. And as we move forward, there are multiple things that, that have to be done. We need to make sure we get the technology right. We need to under, um, understand how to make sense of the risk landscape. But a large part of this is having relevant conversations and useful conversations. So if you go back to that analogy of the nanotechnology elephant, Things could have been a lot easier if people were actually having conversations where they were listening to each other and learning from each other rather than talking over each other. So we're beginning to do this with emerging technologies more broadly. Some of you may be familiar with some of the moves around um, one particular area, responsible innovation or responsible research and innovation. This is largely coming out of Europe. So this is partially an attempt to help people understand that landscape in a different way and have these conversations. Um, and a, another heads up, I want to put this up because this is a book that's coming out in July and it's probably the most comprehensive collection of perspectives on responsible innovation published to date. Um, this will be published just in a few weeks' time. But I also want to put it out because there is a chapter there written by my former student, Elizabeth Garvey, and myself that actually calls the responsible innovation community to task. And it calls them to task because what we've seen over the last five, six years or so is an idea that is rooted in academia and philosophical ideals that is very, very hard to put into practice in reality. In fact, most people in businesses that look at this say, these are great ideas about being responsible and doing the right thing. In practice, it makes no sense to us. And we wrote this piece that said, especially if you're an entrepreneur in the US, we've got to think differently about how we get technologies right. We've got to have different conversations. We've got to approach this from a different perspective. Um, and just as an aside, this is part of my work at the moment at Arizona State University. So one of the ways that we're having these different conversations is through a project called the Risk Innovation Accelerator, which is designed specifically for working with entrepreneurs and startups where, with a very small time investment, they can begin to understand the nature of this risk and benefit landscape that they're facing. Um, we even use the analogy of a landscape here where we're beginning to look at what we call orphan risks. So these are the risks that people typically don't think about but are likely to upset them if they're not investing some time in trying to understand them. And just to give you an indication of what these are like, this is just one of them. The risk of not understanding how perceptions of a risk, especially around a new technology, is likely to upset you in your enterprise if you haven't actually put that investment in. So here you can see this is part of a, um, a card set where we give very simple definitions of these types of risks that people should be thinking about but they're not thinking about. But the reason we do that is it's very clear that if we're going to see the benefits of this whole swath of new technologies, we've got to have different conversations between different stakeholders. Um, and the problem is, if you look back, to, certainly with nanotechnology, we saw that with genetic modification, we're now seeing it with artificial intelligence, self-driving vehicles, and a number of other areas. When people try and have conversations, it's usually like this. They're talking at each other with the person on one side saying, you fool, you idiot, you don't understand me, and the person on the other side coming from a different perspective saying exactly the same thing. This is not a very productive way of developing new technologies in ways that are going to benefit society. But something really interesting happens when you put a third component into the mix. Um, and here my third component is movies. So this is where we get back to the movie theme. If you take the emphasis off each of those parties trying to talk to each other and get them to focus on something else, you can open up really interesting conversations. So now people talk about what they're looking at and say, that's interesting. I wonder if we can learn this from it. And it turns out that movies are really powerful as being this third object that people focus on as a way of opening up conversations. They're powerful because people can have opinions and perspectives about movies. But if you think about who goes to a movie, who will watch a movie, and who will have something to talk about about a movie, it cuts across every single sector of society and every single sector of stakeholders that are involved with emerging technologies.
So this is the thinking behind the book Films from the Future. It isn't really a book about science fiction movies, but it's a book about how we can use science fiction movies as that third object to stimulate conversations about what is happening with emerging technologies, how we can understand not only the benefits, but the potential pitfalls, and how together we can work out how to navigate around them. Um, so you look at the book, and I just want to go through quickly sort of what the, the thinking behind the, the content of the book was. So this was a book where I had a number of specific aims, but these are the top ones. I wanted to dig into something that we're increasingly calling technological convergence. So I talked a lot about individual trends in technology innovation. The really transformative stuff that's happening at the moment is happening at the intersections between those, where you've got convergence between different technologies. And increasingly, certainly if you go to the business sector, you'll find that people aren't particularly interested in what you call a technology. They're just interested in what you can do when you merge different interesting ideas together. So the book really gets at that idea of getting away from convenient labels with technologies and beginning to look at what happens when you have convergence between different capabilities. But it also begins to look at social dynamics because we know that tech innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It only happens when you've got a way of navigating that complex dynamic between people and society and technological capabilities. And it looks at responsible innovation, but it doesn't really talk about the formal nature of responsible innovation. It asks the question, if as a society we want to see the true benefits of some of these quite amazing technologies, how do we actually do that? And then it's also infused with the ideas of empowerment and hope. The idea that we can do some quite incredible things with tech innovation, and if we're thinking about the future, we can see a pathway to building a better and more vibrant future. But we've got to work out how to develop this map and follow it to this future in order to do that. So the book was written for the public. This is a, a very much a trade book. It's an easy read. But also, it had these other audiences in mind, researchers and innovators, because if people that are actually developing the new technologies understood this landscape, they'd be able to make easier early decisions on how they actually do their research and where they actually direct it. Also directed towards businesses and policymakers and civil society NGOs because in many ways this is a map for how to think about the complex landscape associated with emerging technologies. And it did that through following a very specific narrative arc, starting with bio-based technologies, moving on to cyber-based technologies, and then looking more, in more detail at materials, and especially advanced materials, before it looked at some cross-cutting issues. So anybody that's familiar with emerging thinking around the fourth industrial revolution um, will see that effectively what this is, is it's setting up a framework that is very similar to the fourth industrial revolution in terms of looking at not only bio cyber materials technologies, but also the convergence between them. And around that backbone, it used 12 movies. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but the movies were chosen very, very specifically to tell this story about emerging and converging technologies. But they were also, I must confess, chosen because they had to be movies that I was going to enjoy watching time and time and time again. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm now very fond of every single one of these movies. And anybody that is a movie buff will look at that and think, yeah, I can understand why that's there. I have no idea why you've got a 20% Rotten Tomatoes movie there. Um, so this is a very diverse set of movies. Some of them are not great movies, but they form a really good conversation starter around different aspects of tech innovation. Um, so just to give you a sense of the sort of um, topics that are covered, and this is where I'm going to break all of my rules with giving presentations um, and put up slides that you're just not going to be able to read through the text. And I'm only doing this because I know you're going to be able to get hold of the, the slides afterwards. Um, but I want to put it up to give you a sense of the types of technologies that the book talks about, just pulling out a couple. You've obviously got nanotechnology there. But you've also got things like cloning, behavior prediction, the developments in artificial intelligence, what this means, what it doesn't mean. I've got super intelligence there, so anybody that knows about the conversations around artificial intelligence taking over the world, um, I debunk that fairly and squarely in the book. No, the machines are not going to take over the world, at least not in the way you think. They may do it in other ways. Um, 
but more than that, and this is where you're going to get really mad at me, um, the book deals with a lot of complex issues at that intersection between science and technology. And I'm going to skip over that really fast because you won't be able to read it. But what I did want to do in just beginning to wrap this up is give you a sense of what one of those conversation starters is like. And I want to do that by going through this one particular movie, the 1951 movie, The Man in the White Suit. As a matter of interest, how many of you here have actually seen The Man in the White Suit with a young Alec Guinness? Chosan. Oh, wow. Yes, a couple of you. So this, I, I, I was actually in two minds to put this in because it is an old movie. Um, I thought it was a really dry movie. It's supposed to be a comedy, but actually it's, um, well, actually my students seem to think that it's funnier than I think it is. Um, but it is a great movie for trying to explore, beginning to explore that intersection between science and society. It's actually one of the most scientifically accurate movies I know. It's quite impressive if you go back to look at it. So this is a movie um, that was based around advances in textiles and polymer science. And it pulls on a lot of what was happening between the 1930s and 1950s. Um, and it's based around this scientist um, played by Alec Guinness, Sidney Stratton, who is a brilliant scientist, a brilliant polymer scientist, um, but something of a maverick, who was sure that he was on the cusp of developing the perfect textile. A textile that was so strong it wouldn't break and was utterly stain resistant. And he thought this was going to revolutionize society. He couldn't understand why anybody would not want clothes that lasted forever and would never stain. Um, and as you can imagine, things didn't quite go the way he um, thought they would. So just to sort of walk you through the way the chapter goes, this is actually a chapter um, that I talk a lot about nanotechnology. And so even though the movie isn't about nanotechnology, it has a lot of deep resonances with what we've been doing with material science over the last two decades. Um, including, so the, the first um, part of the chapter is called There's Plenty of Room at the Bottom, which reflects a Richard Feynman talk from the late 1950s, where he speculated about what we could do with nanotechnology. Um, and I'd start here um, because in the early 2000s, um, and some of you may remember this, there was a protest in Chicago where a bunch of topless people were protesting outside Eddie Bauer for their profligate use of nanotechnology. And Eddie Bauer's use of nanotechnology at the time was to produce stain-resistant clothing. Um, and this group used Richard Feynman's, um, the, the title Richard Feynman's talk, there's plenty of room at the bottom, um, both because they were topless and bottomless, so they, they used their pun, but also to warn against the dangers of nanotechnology. Um, that was a protest that didn't go well because people saw the protest and they thought stain-resistant pants got to get some. And there was actually an uptick in sales. Um, but, but this is used to frame the movie and just to give you an outline of the movie. Um, but then that transitions into the nature of advanced materials. So um, the, the chapter tells the story about nanotechnology, why we started investing in it, looking at the economics, the politics of it, as well as the, the science behind it. It begins to develop this idea of mastering the material world by being able to manipulate the properties of materials by designing their structure at the atomic scale. So this is actually really getting into advanced materials rather than nanotechnology strictly. And it talks about our ability to actually change the world around us with very, very sophisticated techniques in terms of how we actually design materials at the atomic scale. But then it begins to look at some of the dangers of being very narrow-sighted with this. So Sidney Stratton was a myopic scientist. He was also a very benevolent scientist. He wanted to make the world a better place, but actually really he was just interested in his science. He had no idea about the consequences of his actions. He just thought he was doing cool science and everybody would love him for it. And so he was actually quite shocked when he discovered that people were rather worried about what he was doing. What he did was not only did he forget to talk to people, he underestimated the status quo. So as it turned out, the industry saw his um, ideas and decided the most important thing to do was utterly bury what he was doing. Because what the world absolutely did not need is clothes that never wear out. There would be no economic driver for it. Companies would go out of business. Not only that, poor Sidney Stratton discovered that his fellow workers 
hated the idea. So the union that was initially supportive of him, they thought that he was a, a poor misused scientist, suddenly realized that he was going to be putting them out of a job. So that did not go down well either. Um, and then the, um, the chapter finishes with this idea about conversation and dialogue. Because it's very clear going through that the biggest mistake Sidney Stratton made was he didn't talk to people. He assumed he knew what people wanted and what was good for them. And if only he'd have had those conversations, he'd have realized, first of all, that the way he was going about things was not a great way. It was pretty much doomed to failure. But if he'd done things differently, he could have actually seen the evolution of his technology in a very positive way. So just to get a, a really small sense of that, um, I've got one really small movie clip which I hope will work here. So this is right at the end of the movie. So this is where Sidney has made his suit. He's wearing his, his white stain-resistant suit. Um, and everybody has decided that um, the thing that they can't stand more than anything else is a smart-ass scientist, so they're out to effectively lynch him, and he's running away from the mob. Um, and as he's running away, he bumps into his landlady, who represents the public here. And he thinks, surely she is going to be supportive. Surely this, this ordinary person is going to understand what he's doing. And as he bumps into her, he asks her for help, and this is what he gets. Oh, no, that's... Mrs. Watson, have you got something? My suit. They can see me. Why can't you scientists leave things alone? What about my bit of washing when there's no washing to do? And I love that scene because the most important thing was not the end of society as we know it. It was about her washing and her livelihood. And so often with tech innovation, we think we've got a great idea, but because we don't have those conversations, we don't understand how it's going to interfere with what's important to other people and how to find that connection between what we value and what they value so we can actually build it together. So just to, to wrap this up, so I, I've given you a very broad perspective of why I wrote the book, what's in it, why I think it's important. Um, I just wanted to give one little bit of validation to this. So um, I teach a course on these, these movies, um, and I use the ideas in the book for this course. Um, I've taught it a couple of years now to, to undergraduates, and I have undergraduates from all sorts of backgrounds, um, a lot of them from science and engineering, um, some of them from business and um, the social sciences. And we use the course to take them very actively and very specifically through the process of thinking differently about that intersection between science, technology, and society. And I'm always amazed at the end of the course at the insights that I get from the students. So one of their last assignments is for them to actually describe what they've learned from the course and how their thinking has changed. And I just want to put up one comment um, from the course from this last year. So the last, uh, just to put this into context, the last movie we watch is Carl Sagan's um, Contact, where the, the main character is Dr. Arroway. Um, let me just read this out. Of all the characters in the films we've seen, or, sorry, all of the characters in the films we've seen have struggled to make it understood why they've put so much faith into their technologies. But they all seek it for the same reason Dr. Arroway looked out to the stars, to find something more. And I wanted to put this up because it reflects a couple of things. First of all, it reflects that the vast majority of scientists and technologists are out to make the world a better place. They're seeking for something that actually helps other people as well as helps them understand who they are. But with almost every one of these movies, we see that despite their best intentions, they get things wrong because they don't understand the broader context within which they're working. Which brings me back to the, the crux of the book here. And that is, if we're to actually see the benefits of the technologies we're developing and the science we're developing, whether that's in areas as diverse as artificial intelligence and self-driving cars, or whether it's looking at the next iteration of food and nutrition technologies, We've got to think differently about how we do it. We're no longer in a world where just having good, 
interesting science and technology works. We've got to understand an incredibly complex dynamic between different stakeholders, whether those stakeholders are members of the public, whether they're NGOs, whether they're policy makers, whether they're researchers with vested interest. It's only when we understand those dynamics, it's only when we have those conversations that we can actually build or begin to build technologies that truly do succeed and true, truly work. So with that, I'm going to wrap up, apart from to say, if this has at all interested you, uh, you, I'm always interested in people buying the book. Um, <laughs> it's available on Amazon. Um, and with that, I think we have a little bit of time for questions. Thank you.